Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our second annual MSK Week. MSK Week is focused on young Black women making their health a priority while navigating milestones. My name is Bilkis Habib, and I'm the program coordinator for the My Sisters Keeper program here at the Black Women's Health Imperative. I'm the moderator for this evening's panel, Black Women in the Workforce, Early Career Professionals that will highlight some phenom phenomenal black, young Black women who are in the early stages of their careers and already making an impact. Let's begin by introducing our amazing panelists. First up, I have a newly minted doctor, Dr. Alexis Crenshaw. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Crenshaw. Dr. Crenshaw is a fifth year doctor of psychology and clinical psychology candidate at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology at Washington, DC. She is scheduled to begin her residency at Andrews Air Force Base in PG County, Maryland in June, 2022, and will serve as a captain providing members and their families therapeutic services. Dr. Crenshaw's background includes working with veterans, incarcerated individuals and individuals with serious mental illness in both the private and federal sector. Dr. Krenstahl's research interests entail examining cultural mistrust, stigma, and systemic processes and institutions that hinder African-Americans help-seeking behaviors and susceptibility for therapy. Additionally, Dr. Crenshaw is interested in research pertaining to the overdiagnosis and overrepresentation of African-Americans in psychotic-related disorders. Dr. Crenshaw has earned a Bachelor of Science in Psychology at Morgan State University and has received two Masters of Arts in both Forensic Psychology and Clinical Psychology from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology at Washington, D.C. Dr. Crenshaw is a proud and active member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and enjoys traveling in her free time. Thank you again, and thank you so much for being here, and cannot wait to speak with you in a few minutes. Next, I have Peja Edwards. Peja Edwards is a woman's reproductive and maternal health advocate certified lactation education specialist and birth doula. She has over eight years of experience in healthcare and administration and public health, working with historically oppressed and marginalized communities. Peja received her bachelor of science degree in healthcare management with a minor in communication from California State University, San Bernardino, and her master of public health degree with a concentration in urban community health from California State University, Los Angeles. After obtaining her MPH, Peja continued her education by becoming a certified lactation education specialist and birth doula. Describing herself as a lover of laughter, joy, and self-expression, she hopes to spread more love and light to the community she serves. Thank you so much, Peja, for being here, and I'm so excited to speak with you as well. Next up, last but certainly not least, I have another one of the newest doctors in town, Dr. LaShonda Johnson. Congrats on finishing up med school, 11 days, 11 days. So LaShonda Johnson is a fourth year medical student at Meharry Medical College. Upon graduation in May, she'll be completing her residency training in emergency medicine at Washington University Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri. A native of Baltimore, Maryland, she first became interested in becoming a physician after witnessing the unique needs of minority and underserved populations and the lack of diversity within the medical field. This interest further ensued during her employment as a scribe in the emergency department for over two years. Currently, she serves as a mentor to pre-medical students and on her class executive board. Her interests include serving the underserved, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and social emergency medicine. LaShonda hopes to improve healthcare for underserved populations and continue to inspire underrepresented minorities to pursue careers in medicine. Okay, so now that our audience has a feel for the heavy hitters that we'll be in conversation with today, I'd like to bring back Dr. Crenshaw so we can learn more about her amazing work and how she has navigated the psychology field to get to where she is now. Hello, Dr. Crenshaw. Hi, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know it's been back to back for you. So right now, I just wanted to get like, you know, what has your journey been like in the field of psychology and what made you interested in the field in the first place and your current population that you serve? Whew. Okay, yes, it has been a journey <laughs> for sure. I, I feel like I have been school forever. Um, but to get started, um, I just think psychology has been something that has been near and dear to my heart. Um, I grew up in a law enforcement family. I mean, my entire family, my mom is a retired New York City correctional officer. My brother is NYPD. And then I have my aunts in the DA's office. So law enforcement is something that I was literally born into. Um, so from there, I knew that I really was interested more so in um, the way people think and why do criminals, you know, commit the crimes that they do and found out that there's a word for it is, you know, forensic right. psychology. I'm like, wow, you can study this, you know? Right. Um, so I did my research and I went into psychology, um, into Morgan State. And from there, it was more of a generalist track. 
Um, but I wanted to further my education because, of course, for those who know, if you're in any liberal arts type of program, mm -hmm. you have to go past that bachelor's level if you want to start making some money. So <laughs> um, I definitely uh, re-enrolled right into my master's program directly after and um, started studying forensic psychology. And after that, I was basically like, OK, can't really make as much money here and what I want to do. So I'm going to go to that doctoral level and been here since now five years. So nice, nice. Yeah. The great thing about psychology is like there's just such a wide variety of things that you can do with a degree. So that's just amazing that you found your niche, especially given your background as well. So I, I've studied psychology too as an undergrad. So I'm very excited to hear more about like how you've noticed certain overdiagnoses or representation equally in the civilian sector as in the military. I can imagine there may be differences between the two populations that you've researched in your time in the field. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. As we can imagine, when we look at um, the military population, both active duty, you know, reserves or veterans, um, a lot of the diagnoses are pertaining towards post-traumatic stress disorder, um, a lot of anxiety related dis disorders. We also see a history of MST, which is military sexual trauma amongst most of our women veterans. Um, so from there, um, a lot of that has to do with trauma related disorders um, compared to in the civilian sector, I have also worked in a psychiatric hospital. And from there, that's where I really see a lot of the um, overdiagnosis of African-Americans as it relates to psychotic related disorders. So a lot of African-Americans are diagnosed with schizophrenia. We see a lot of antisocial personality disorders, which is only 1% of the population that is supposed to be diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. Um, but a lot of African-Americans are filling up that gap in these psychotic related disorders, which is um, particularly overwhelming because if we think about it, African-Americans only make up 13.4% of the United States population. So when we're seeing 80% of those individuals that are African-Americans, they are definitely overpopulated and over um, generalized as it relates to psychotic disorders. So completely um, disheartening to say the least. So with that being said, since we are overrepresenting those statistics, what are some solutions that we could look into that you have found so far in your studies? Mm -hmm. I think first and foremost is really just working to debunk the stigma of mental health amongst African-Americans. Um, I did my whole dissertation on um, cultural mistrust and stigma and how, you know, African-Americans are reluctant to go into therapy because of, you know, our history in the United States and before we came to the States and not being trusting of healthcare systems as a whole and thinking about mental health, how that falls under another institution, a, a white dominated um, system. So with that, I think is really working to debunk the stigma that is related to mental health services. I think a lot of times as African-Americans, we really rely on our informal coping mechanisms. So, mm -hmm. you know, girl, go to go to church, give it to God, you know, pray to it. And, and and God still exists, right? So you can still have, you know, your spirituality, you can still have your religion, but mental health is real, right? So we can't right. just get rid of it with a prayer. Like God works wonders. He works miracles. I'm a firm believer, but it's, we have to do work as well. We have to play our part. So I think a lot of that goes into, you know, actually being able to go to therapy, find therapists that we like, have people go to school and fill these gaps. You know, you want to have a, a therapist or a counselor, someone that looks like you, that can relate to you. You know, I don't want to sit across from you and I'm like, well, what can she tell me about myself? You don't know right. the struggle, you know? Right. So, I, I think it's important. Representation truly does matter. So um, a huge solution is having a lot of Black African-Americans go into the field, especially African-American men, because that is definitely a deficit that we are seeing now. For sure, for sure. And I love how you talked about like, you know, even if you are spiritual, you know, God does help those who help themselves. You know, you got to do what you got to do um, so that way you can work through the people he's placed in your lives to help your life as well. So that's very beautiful. So what has been the most surprising or compelling finding from years of research? Because I know with all the years that you've done research, there's something that's, you know, stuck out to you that really, you know, solidified why you're in the field. Mm -hmm. I think um, some of my research that I did most recently um, when looking at African-Americans, millennials specifically, um, their 
likeliness or their um, willingness to want to go to therapy. And I found that um, it has been probably the same as our older generations and our ancestors that African Americans are still a race who are reluctant to go into therapy, which I found very, very surprising because we mm -hmm. live in this social media world right now. Everybody is like Instagram therapist right. and who's in there like, you know, go get a therapist. This is the, the coolest thing to do. Or you see TikToks and they're like, I went to therapy today and I did this. And it's like it in the social media realm, it seems like it's something that is more so what's in, right? Like it's something that is, it's a facade at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that I expected for the numbers to be different in my research where millennials are now leading um, the causes to want to go to therapy, but it actually, it is the same um, as our as our um, older generation. So that was really surprising. So do you think that ties back into the uh, thing that you mentioned about not having a, enough representation? Like, you know, you want to go to a therapist, but you can't find anybody in network. You can't find anyone who will really understand you because you can go and you just feel like eh, I'm wasting money just to talk to somebody. I can just talk to my friends, for example. Absolutely. And then we go into accessibility as well. So is my insurance going to cover this um, provider that might be out of network? You know, is the provider that I want, do they actually have availability? Because now if I'm like the only black woman provider in the area that takes, you know, a certain type of insurance, now my wait list is going to be out the door. So I think that we're looking at accessibility. We're looking at trust. We're looking at people having insight into the fact that, do I actually need therapy? So right. there's so many barriers that are actually preventing people from, from doing that. Right. I can only imagine, because especially as a young person, just even thinking about trying to find another therapist, especially with being 25, then you have that transition to, you know, being 26, leaving your parents' um, insurance is just a headache. So I know there's a lot of barriers, but what are some things that, you know, we could do as young people to really champion our mental health, um, even if it's not there, people, you know, do positive coping mechanisms in that regard. I think, you know, relationships are completely important, whether they are platonic, familial, um, romantic. I think it's important to just really find a tribe, find your tribe that you trust, right? Find um, whether it's your girls, your guys, whatever the case may be, and find what you like to do and find people that you can confide in. Because a lot of the times I feel like we live in a society where everyone is just like, oh, I don't need anybody. You know, I'm self-made and this, that, and the third. But in actuality, we, we need people, right? Right. Uh, I don't care how self-made you are. You didn't come into this world alone. Right. Um, and we are humans. We require love. We require, um, you know, company. So I think that finding someone, even if it's one other person where you can trust and you can confide in them and just really be able to have that companionship, I think. COVID has shown us that so much where, you know, the beginning stages of 2020, where we were literally isolated and we had nothing but um, technology to really just um, communicate with one another and the importance of um, us seeing that, you know, separation can really do things to our mental health. So being able to socialize um, and, and self-care, like, what do you like to do? Like, prioritize that. I think that is super important. Um, I know there's only 24 hours in a day, um, but making sure if you carve out just five minutes to yourself to just meditate, to do something that is for you, then really prioritize that daily. And I'm glad you mentioned that because my next question to you is like, how did you view the idea of work-life balance in your own life while you navigated professional school in your early training? Because I can only imagine how hectic it gets in your day-to-day. -day. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, I've been in school my whole life. Like I right. haven't breaks whatsoever. I went straight through to undergrad, to my master's, to my second master's, and now um, my doctoral program. So um, one of those things where I really find solace and my friends will tell you like, I'm on a, I'm on a plane. I'm I'm going on a trip. And I don't care if I have to go by myself, but I'm going on this trip. That's so <laughs> And I don't, I don't wait for anyone. And they like, you know, Lex, what, what country are you in this week? You know, where are you going? But for me, that's really my self-care. And any break that I get, I prioritize getting on a plane, you know, getting in the water, just having something that is for me. So I think that traveling has really been my outlet. It allows me to connect to people, allows me to just really, you know, broaden my horizons and really just learn more about other cultures, other people, make lifelong friends. So that's my outlet. I'm not, I don't have a trip lined up because I'm starting residency in a couple of weeks, which is a little disappointing, but you know, this is the final stretch and I'm looking forward to getting 
back out there as well. And I'm so excited to have you in the field, you know, of working as a doctor. So thank you again um, for sharing about your work, your life. And we'll see you again later once we bring on the other pa panelists for our roundtable portion. So next up, I'd like to bring on Peja Edwards. Hey, Peja. Hello. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. I'm just so excited to hear about your work because I don't think a lot of our viewers, you know, actually understand what it is that you may do. So mm -hmm. for everyone who may not know, could you share with us what a doula is or what a certified lactation lactation specialist is? And could you give us a look into your average work day? Absolutely. Um, so whew. Things. So a doula can be multiple things. So there's um, various types of doula. So I am in particular a birth doula. However, there are full spectrum doulas, there are postpartum doulas, um, there are prenatal doulas, there are even sex doulas, right? There's different types of doulas um, for essentially any type of me that you that you have. So in particular, in particular, a birth doula is someone who supports you through um, your pregnancy, um, someone who supports you through your labor and delivery, and also someone who supports you through the beginning half of your postpartum. So um, in particular, what it looks like for labor and delivery support is providing several different types of comfort measures. So providing physical, emotional, spiritual, um, informational, um, as well as mental um, support. So um, performing specific physical measures measures to help um, reduce pain during labor and delivery, being there to be a champion, um, being there to be an advocate, especially um, I'm someone who identifies as a community doula, meaning that um, I mostly work with, um, with women who identify as Black for my community. And um, in spaces when you're interfacing with the health system, um, so in a hospital or just with clinical profession professionals, sometimes, um, as we all know, there, there are certain biases that clinical professionals can have towards black women and not listening to their pain and not listening to what they want to do, not really um, giving the space for black women and black birthing people to have autonomy over their bodies, autonomy over their birthing journey. So part of my role as a community doula is while I'm in that room is to advocate for my patient. So um, to advocate for my client. So my client has told me, hey, we've gone over her birth plan and she told me that she wants a non-medical, um, a non-medicine um, birth, that she doesn't mm -hmm. want any medical intervention. Then that means that I'm reminding, hey, no, no Pitocin. I'm reminding that no, no, we don't want we don't want these certain procedures, no epidural, whatever the case may be, and making sure that they're listening to that. At the end of the day, I can't make choices or decisions, obviously, for my for my clients. However, I can be there as a as a voice to advocate um, and stand in the really stand in the gap for my clients. So um, doulas are just great support folks to really keep an extra eye on things, and they definitely help to improve adverse um, maternal health outcomes as well as adverse in, um, infant outcomes. So that's doula. <laughs> so um, certified lactation education specialist or CLES for short, because it is a mouthful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's exactly what it's that what it sounds like. So it's a lactation education specialist. So for those who are breastfeeding or chest feeding, specifically providing support um, in the realm of lactation. So providing support with teaching, um, you know, proper latch, providing support for teaching breast anatomy for um, and chest anatomy, providing support for um, helping, you know, mamas understand that baby is getting enough milk, right? Understanding the difference between input and output um, when you're feeding baby, how, when to look out for signs that maybe you need some more support or maybe you need to, you know, go to a pediatrician or maybe you need a diagnosis. Maybe baby has a tongue tie but really um, providing educational support as well as um, as well as emotional support for um, breastfeeding and chest feeding mamas and people. Um, so it's all about just providing that support and education to those who need it. Um, I am, in addition to all of that, I'm also an RJ advocate and I currently work for an organization called Expecting Justice here in San Francisco. And I am the associate director for that um, for the program. And um, so on a regular basis, my organization works within three different focus areas, and one of them is doula access. So on a regular basis, I'm not necessarily interfacing with clients on a regular basis and going in person to labors and deliveries, but I do a lot of policy um, advocacy and a lot of um, doula administration, so to speak. So for example, right now, I'm in the midst of directing um, and implementing a doula training for Black, Pacifica, and Latin and Latin A folks here um, in San Francisco. So 
daily basis, just a lot of admin, um, a lot of advocacy advocacy as well, utilizing my doula knowledge in these different spaces that you wouldn't necessarily always see a doula, but in the spaces that doulas are necessary. Nice, nice. That just sounds like such fulfilling work and really much needed, especially learning about all the stats. You know, you might be in the public health field, just hear about all the stats and you're just like, wow, what can we do? So like, what was your first introduction to your current role and roles? Because it's multiple roles. Um, and what are the steps you took to become certified and practicing? Absolutely. So my introduction, I would say, just started when I was in grad school getting my MPH, my Master of Public Health degree. And um, it was an introduction really to the stark disparities in Black maternal and infant health. Um, I was sitting in a class and completely dumbfounded by the stats that I was seeing. And um, I just became extremely interested in learning more about why did these disparities exist. And every single answer pointed back to racism. There was not enough education. There was not, there was, there's no education. There's no um, income that could, you know, that could change really the outcomes that black, um, that black women are experiencing, black and birthing people are experiencing. So that was my first introduction. That's what really got me passionate and like, revved me up. Right. And then um, in that, it led me on my journey to figuring out how can I be the change that I want to see. I knew about doulas, but I really just started doing um, a deep dive into what a doula is and how that could be the impact and the change that I wanted to see in Black maternal health um, and infant health disparities. So anywho, all that to say, that was my introduction. And so I just did a deep dive in and I decided to continue forward and take a um, doula training. And um, from there, I continued on and become became a certified lactation education specialist because lactation um, rates also in the Black community are fairly low and it's not of any individual behavior. It's because of systemic and environmental, environmental factors. And CLESs are great because we're able to provide that support that not only that educational support to mamas right we're not really yeah. trying to address behavior we're really trying to address these systems in these environments that mamas are operating within um so that's really how i got interested and that was like my you know my my tipping like my jump off point so it started mm -hmm. with grad school and i just continued on my journey learning more and more about it and um just led me to where i am today nice so like as you're working currently what is something that you wish you knew prior to becoming a doula that would have helped make your journey a bit easier for those who are interested, you know, how long is the program? What do you have to do to get there? Yeah. So I wish what I would have known about being a doula, I wish I would have known like three things. I wish that I would have known that there are a multitude of ways to become a doula. So um, there is really no such thing as a certified doula. It's more so like a Western pro like a Western understanding that there's a mm -hmm. such thing as a, a certified doula. Doulas have always been and will always be support folks, right? There are grandmother doulas, folks who um, are grandmothered in, there are legacy doulas, those who were legacied in where they just started attending birth. If you are someone who is attending a birth, who's providing physical, emotional, social, right, mental and advocacy support, then you are a doula, <laughs> right? You don't necessarily have to be certified to be a doula. So I wish that I really would have understood that because I went down a, down a path that was, um, different than the path that I would have chosen mm -hmm. today. I would have chosen definitely a community-centered training, a Black community-centered training, um, because in those types of trainings, in particular, like the training that I'm running, like you really get to understand why these ex these disparities are existing and how you as, as a Black woman or as a Black doula or a doula of color, whatever the case may be, can really be that person who stands in the gap for other folks from your community. So I wish I would have known that. <laughs> um, and um, something else that I wish that I would have known, I wish that I would have understood like how vast the work is. It's not just attending birth. So there are doulas who specifically, hey, I'm here for the birth work. <laughs> I'm here to go to the, I'm here, right, yeah. for the birth and postpartum, prenatals, and that's it. That's all I'm here for, right? And that's completely okay. We need those people. But there's also this um, this advocacy that takes place and this policy that takes place. For example, in California, we just had a bill passed last year called SB 65, the California Mama Miss Bill. And as part of the part of this bill um, in California, doula services are going to be covered by Medicaid, Medi-Cal mm -hmm. in California. But there was a lot of advocacy. There was a lot of lobbying. There was a lot of policy work that went into that. I'm, I was a part of the work that went into that. I'm currently um, still sitting on that group working to help with the implementation piece. So I wish that I would have understood how vast it is and how many different areas there are for me to get into it. 
Thank you so much for all that you do. And I'm looking forward to connecting again with you at the round table portion of our discussion today. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So next up, I have Dr. LaShonda Johnson. Hopefully, Dr. LaShonda can join us. So Dr. Lashana's gone real quick. So I'm gonna bring back um, Fasia just to ask a couple more questions. That's, I have so much to ask you, <laughs> so much to know. So like, um, what? So with all that that you said, what has been the most rewarding experience in your role so far? Like what keeps you going in your role? Cause you know, of course mm -hmm. you've heard about all the disparities, you're like, oh, I must help. What keeps you helping? What keeps me helping? I will say that it's hard, right? So when you are doing community work, especially when you're doing reproductive justice, birth justice work, it's hard. Like you have to always look for your why. And for me, it's understanding that it's not just, you know, it's not just about passing this policy. It's not a just, you know, it's not just about creating this new program. It's the fact that we're really impacting lives. You know, um, when I'm able to see a new baby who arrived here, right, who arrived here safely, Earthside, and that mom is okay and mom is healthy, right, that keeps me going. You know, those stories keep me going. But then at the same time, what also keeps me going is understanding that that there are more mamas who need support and you know if we stop then who's going to be there to provide to provide that support so that's what keeps me going nice thank you again um thank we you. have dr johnson back with us hey dr johnson hi how are you doing today i am great how are you i'm doing well i'm so glad to be in you guys' presence just <laughs> learning so much so you know, just being a medical doctor, I know right now you're just a sigh of relief going through everything that you've gone through in your journey. So can yes. you tell us more about what your journey in medicine has been like? Oh, yes. As you have mentioned, it has been quite <laughs> the journey. Mm -hmm. um, I was one of those people who I've always wanted to be a doctor as far as I can remember. I mean, like as a kid, I would play doctor with my baby dolls. Instead of watching cartoons, I was watching Discovery Health Channel. I was always um, so fascinated by it. Um, so, you know, I did, went to high school. Um, I attended undergrad at Morgan State University. Um, and after completing undergrad, I had a little bit of difficulty with the MCAT. Um, for those who don't know, that is the mm -hmm. test that you take to gain entrance into medical school. Um, and so I went to work as a scribe in the emergency department. Um, and that's kind of where I fell in love with emergency medicine. Um, and during that time, I applied to medical school the first time, didn't get in, um, and I decided to do a master's program at my uh, medical school that I'm in now. And so I did that for a year and uh, matriculated into medical school, and I will be done in 11 days. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so happy for you because as someone who is pre-med, I'm taking the non-traditional route as you did. Um, you know, the, the main question that's always at the forefront is our why, because it's just like, why am I here at these books? Yes. Why am I getting acquainted with Kaplan? Why am I doing all these things with Khan Academy? So it's something that's always being cultivated as we gain new experiences and we go through each milestone, such as surviving Orgo, taking the MCAT, et cetera. Yes. So what is the why that keeps you going through each yes. of these? Um, and as you mentioned before, it's something that, you know, has been important to keep in the forefront of my mind throughout this journey, because honestly, during that time when, after I graduated medical school, in between medical school, it was a three-year time period. Um, so, you know, taking the MCAT, I took it a total of three times. I'm like, maybe this is not for right. me. And so, you know, I actually talked about it a lot in my uh, personal statement in my interviews for residency about my why um, and just thinking about the impact that I can have on the medical field. You know, even as a scribe, I would have encounters with patients where, you know, certain providers wouldn't understand the complexities, you know, of, you know, what goes on in the day to day of lives of underserved patients who may live in urban areas. Um, and, you know, just me being able to understand patients better. I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a patient's room, even as a medical student, and the patient, you know, has a sigh of relief saying, you know, I'm so glad that you're here to help take mm -hmm. care of me. Um, also knowing, you know, the potential impact that I can, that I can have on uh, those coming behind me. Um, I, you talked about it earlier, but, you know, mentorship is one of my other passions outside of clinical medicine. And, you know, 2% of physicians are Black women. So, you know, I know that, you know, me and being able to mentor other people, um, also being able to help bring them onto the medical field as well serves as my why. Nice. So I also read that you were a first-generation student. 
Yes. So, you know, we have unique struggles. I'm also a first generation student, um, come from Ghanaian immigrants. So I'm basically, you know, building the plane as I fly. So <laughs> <Yes>. like, <laughs> what effect has, you know, that experience of trying to figure out things as you're doing them, you know, led you into mentorship and becoming a mentor and how has mentorship uh, impacted you and your field? Yeah. Um, you know, me going through all the struggles that I've gone through, I'm like, there's no reason that I've gone through this without being able to use it to help someone else. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a lot of times going through this journey, I was doing things and, you know, it was a lot of trial and a whole lot of error. And then it just, you know, dawned on me, like, I am not the first person who have done, who right. done this. You know, there's someone else out there who looks like me who has done this before. And so, you know, I started reaching out, you know, to different people like, hey, you know, this is what I'm going through. And it's just like a sigh of relief to know that, you know, you're not alone. I know oftentimes, you know, as a first generation person in these fields, you know, you kind of get used to learning to do stuff on your own mm -hmm. or, you know, you're the first person to do this and you get all these this praise. But it's like you don't have to do that. There are people, you know, out here that are willing to help you. So, you know, going through the struggles that I went through, I've always vowed to, you know, make time to give my give back in that way. So let's say someone tuning in is having some difficulty finding a mentor. What are some things they can do to find a good fit? What are some places to look and what are some qualities to look for in a mentor? Yeah. So um, there are a lot of organizations out there that provide mentorship for uh, pre-med students. Um, there's the SNMA, which is the Student National Medical Association, and a lot of those um, organizations or medical campuses have sister organizations called MAPS on, on undergraduate campuses who do mentorship. Um, there are also a lot of like nonprofits. I'm a part of an organization called Black Girl White Coat, um, which is, you know, we mentor um, other African American, other minority women. Um, also, do not underestimate the power of social media and contacting people. Um, I've gotten a lot of my mentors just, you know, reaching out on social media saying, hey, you know, you're doing some things that I'm interested in doing. You know, can we set up a call and, you know, talk about these things? Um, I think, you know, when looking for a mentor, you know, trying to find somebody who has the same interests and same goals as you, um, possibly setting up a call to, you know, assess if there's a good fit. Um, but when looking for mentors, I typically try to look for somebody who, you know, is open minded. Um, in the mentor world, they talk a lot about having mask on and mask off mentors. I prefer the mask off mentors where, you know, I'm comfortable being myself, um, talking about, you know, my struggles. Um, also finding somebody that can hold you accountable and, you know, push you to your full potential. Um, I've had, you know, different opportunities presented to me and I'm like, uh, I don't know if I could do this, but having that extra push for my mentor to, you know, I had a presentation at a national um, conference. And I've never spoken in front of that many people before. My mentor is like, no, we're going to do this thing. Like she sat and practiced with me and, you know, just having her there in my corner just made me feel that much more confident in my abilities. Yeah. That support is key. Cause once again, if you feel like you're doing it all alone, it just feels so daunting. And so yes. <laughs> it's like, where do I even start and where, how am I going to finish? So with each stage, I know you're right now going to your residency. How did you pick your residency, like what type of questions you ask to make sure you're finding a good fit for that as well? Because, you know, with mentorship and being in the spaces that you want to be in, how did you make sure it was a good fit for you for that as well? Yeah. So um, the way residency works in medical school is kind of weird. So it's kind of, it's called the match. So it's based mm -hmm. off of an, of an algorithm. So you kind of don't get to choose, but um, you get to choose where you apply and which residency programs you're going to interview at. So like you said, um, it was key for me to ask certain questions when I was interviewing at places to try to figure out if they were a great fit for me. I know I wanted to work with underserved and minority populations, so it was very important for me to ask these programs, what type of populations, you know, do you serve? Is it prior, prior, primarily, you know, people who have insurance or those who don't lack insurance? Um, so those are what we call county programs um, versus like academic, where there are opportunities to do research. Um, another important question I often ask was what, you know, community engagement was like within these programs or if they didn't have that, what opportunities were there to start community engagement programs. Um, a lot of times we can find out, you know, more information about how to treat our patients within the hospital by engaging with them, you know, with outside of the four walls of the hospital. A lot of the, you know, treatment recommendations and plans that we have um, that we give to patients may not necessarily, you know, be possible to be achieved right. in, you know, based on their home life or whatever social issues that they may have. Yeah, you have to make it make sense because if you're telling them to do something, it's just like, well, I don't yes. know. I'm like, I can yeah, easily why? tell my patient to go exercise or go eat healthy foods. But, right. you know, if they live in an unsafe neighborhood where there aren't any sidewalks or maybe they live in a food desert, that may not be possible. Exactly. Exactly. So with 
that, um, with all the work that you put into finally practicing medicine this summer, um, so what are some things that you have done over the years to maintain your mental and emotional wellness? Yes, um, wellness is key. I always say, like, I have to make sure that I'm well in order for me to be able to show up as my best self for my patients. Um, so I think that, you know, I make sure to take time to myself. Sometimes I may just sit on my couch and, you know, watch TV. Um, I make sure to, you know, make time for, you know, my friends and family because, you know, they are a huge part of my support group. Nice, nice. So with all the stages and everything, what has been your most memorable moment where you were like, oh, yes, I, I'm here. I finally am doing it. This is where I want to be. Um, I don't know if there was necessarily one pivotal like aha moment, but I think mm -hmm. all of those like, you know, have rough days, you know, you're working long hours. Sometimes you're like, is, does any of this even matter? Right. But whenever I walk into an African-American patient's room and literally I could be having the worst day in the world and they're like, I'm so proud of you. Like, I'm so glad that you're here. I'm like, I know, you know, all these hours of studying and, mm -hmm. you know, all this stuff is actually making a difference. So there's purpose in this work that I'm doing. Yeah, no, I can only imagine because I remember back in undergrad and grad graduate school, just having random black people come up to me randomly. I could be having the worst day. Yes. I'm so proud of you, baby. I'm just like, I don't know you, but thank you so thank much. You. Right. I'm like, thank that, you so much. You know, I was having the worst day, but right. okay, we got to keep going. I got a random black woman just waiting just with a word of wisdom. And she's like, wow, mm -hmm. I really needed that. It's like, that's God at work right there. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Dr. Johnson, for your insight. I'll now bring back our other panelists so we can have a group discussion. Welcome back, ladies. Thank you so much. I've learned so much. Um, so you all are just amazing, and I can only imagine the lives you will touch and impact as you progress throughout your careers. So for each of you, who has been someone that has been the role model and leadership mentor that has helped you rise to the occasion and pursue your respective careers? <laughs> Should I take it? And <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. Um, well, I'll go first, um, just because this is just what immediately came to mind. So um, I feel like it's two people. The first person is my little sister, which sounds weird. Um, <laughs> but my little sister, I, I say her, um, my younger sister, we're five years apart. I say her because she's really been like that drive for me, um, knowing that she, that she has me um, to look up to, that, you know, she's looking up to me has been the thing that continues to make me want to strive for better, to be better, because I have to go back and let her know we're first generation college graduates, let alone, you know, first generation Black women who both went on to obtain advanced degrees, you know, and I want to be that person for her who I did not have. Um, so I'll say that. And then the second person is definitely my director, Dr. Zaya Malawa um, of Expecting Justice here in San Francisco. She is this incredible Black um, woman who's a pediatrician and she's a reproductive justice advocate, birth justice advocate. And she just, she goes harder in the paint. We'll say that, right? <laughs> she's amazing. And she just always is ch constantly challenging me to strive for more, but also to recognize my own humanity. And I feel like that's so important, especially as Black women trying to climb up ladders and Black women trying to make names for ourselves or just really honestly trying to help our community sometimes we can kind of let ourselves you know fall by the wayside but you know it's important to recognize our own humanity so those are my two folks nice so beautiful i'll go next um i think i will have to say my mom i think just really thinking about you know everything that she has sacrificed for me and for my siblings like i'm legit the baby um me and my sister is 13 years apart me and my brother is 16 years apart so you know they were basically grown and my mom started over with me um so you can only imagine how that was for her but just you know always offering her unwavering love like they called me the golden child it was just like you know you just came through you you, you saw it through you did everything so i think you know a lot of that is attributed to my mom and her just always being there and allowing me to make mistakes and learn from them, but her just being, you know, the scaffold and just really just rewarding me at such a young age. Like, you know, you get good grades, you could get whatever you want. And I think I kind of ran that into the ground, but I think it was such a great, you know, positive reinforcement and incentives that really just made me want to excel and go further. So I definitely attribute, you know, she's my biggest supporter and I'm really blessed to have her. So, yeah. Oh, 
Yeah, uh, I have to say my grandmother. Um, she, you know, moved our family from North Carolina to Baltimore, um, only had a high school education. And, you know, just to see her strength and determination, she was able to do, you know, much more with, you know, much, sorry, she was able to do a lot more and having a lot less and just seeing her strength and determination. I'm like, I come from that. It's in me, mm -hmm. you know, no matter what obstacles I may face, you know, I can keep going. Yeah. Shout out to all the black women helping black women, you know, from our moms, <laughs> our grandmas, everyone, they're really holding it down for us and helping propel us forward. So since you all have done graduate school to some extent, professional school as well, how do you handle those moments where you see peers already in stages of their lives that we often have to delay when in professional and grad school? Like, you know, starting a family, buying a new house, already in senior level roles. You know, y'all Instagram is like, wow, <laughs> they really made it. I'm over here just studying. How do you, <laughs> yeah, how do you cope with that? How do you like, you know, level with yourself and say, you know what, I'm okay, I'm gonna get there eventually. <laughs> Ooh, that is a real thing. And it's something I struggle with almost daily because like you said, it's everywhere on social media. Yeah. Like Even talking to my friends, they've been in their careers for like 10 years and I'm just starting mine. <laughs> but, you know, it's always, you know, I have to constantly remind myself everyone has their own journey. And, you know, I have purpose in this work that I'm doing. So I got to keep going and my time will come. Yeah, definitely. Everything is for you, right? Run your race, stay in your lane. Because I think a lot of the times, like we live in a world of comparison where, you know, we see these things and we're like, oh my gosh, like I mm -hmm. wish this was me or I won't be happy until. And then like we're putting mm -hmm. that cap on to our happiness or onto our growth. So I think um, just really just reminding ourselves, like me reminding myself is that everything is not what it appears to be. You don't know what people are doing behind the scenes to get what they want or get what they have. You don't know if they had to sell their soul to be doing what they're doing. Um, and I think it's just important to be mindful that, you know, for me, I say God is never going to put me into something where I'm going to fail and that he will always order and align my steps. So just really keeping that mindset. And sometimes it's hard because it's like, man, my friend, are going away and I'm like I'm gonna, yeah. be, <laughs> I'm gonna be in training I can't go but just <laughs> reminding myself that you know all of this is temporary sacrifice and understand that um it's it's just temporary sacrifice for like you know unlimited paradise so just working hard now so I can really enjoy the fruits of my labor yes 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 do you have anything to add yeah I love exactly leave it to the mental health professional but I love exactly what you said <laughs> Like when I was in my grad program, like I didn't have a life for two years and I really just, it was, it was hard. I'm not going to say I definitely took social media uh, breaks and sabbaticals mm -hmm. because I think that you just need it sometimes. And so for me, what, um, what definitely helped was just taking those breaks and also similar to what you said, remembering that everything that glitters ain't gold um, and understanding that we're only seeing one side not only are we only seeing one side, but we're only seeing what folks want us to the see. The highlight reel is the highlight. The highlights, right? right? This is the best part of my day, but you don't know that me and my husband were arguing. Right. <laughs> like, you know, like, you don't know that these kids are crazy, right? You know, like, <laughs> they're running me ragged, right? But we only see the cute family pictures, right? Yeah. And so reminding myself and not to, you know, downplay anyone's joy or to, you know, be that person, but reminding myself that everyone is living in their own humanity, right? And reminding myself that it was just a moment in time. And now I've graduated and I'm living my best life. So yes, as you should, as you should. <laughs> nice. Now, because it's it's real, it's hard, but I think running your own race and just realizing that, you know, everyone's life is going to be different. Everyone's here with a purpose and just being true to your purpose and not reliving anyone else's purposes and repurposing that is key. So with that, when you you know, you, you all are solidified in your roles. You all know that you want to do, but like, have you ever felt imposter syndrome? Because you're confident right now, you know, if you hear your story, like, wow, so amazing. But like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, there's some nights where you're just like, huh, do I really belong here? Do I really need to? So like, how did you navigate through that? How did you handle those things? And how do you even handle the micro mic macro aggressions that you face too, that feed into that imposter syndrome, you know? Who <laughs> <laughs> wants to take it? <laughs> Um, I can take it first. First of all, I don't think that it's past tense. I think that it's something mm -hmm. that just is always there. Like I personally, and I won't speak for the other ladies, but I personally haven't reached a point where it's like, no more imposter syndrome, right. you know, um, especially I was recently promoted into um, my associate director position at my org. I started as a program associate, worked my way up, and now I'm the associate director. And so um, being in this space where it's like, oh my gosh, like I dreamed of this moment, like, you know, while I was in grad school, crying over biostats homework at the kitchen table. <laughs> 
table, right? <laughs> like, no, really. No, <laughs> like, everyone say yeah. night. Everyone say night. Um, you know, um, I dreamed of this moment, you know, and then um, you get here and it's like, I don't know, something like about imposter syndrome, you kind of freeze and like, wow, this mm-hmm. is really happening. And so the way that I navigated is I like have affirmations all over my house. <laughs> like I have this affirmation from my fiance right here. You're doing great. Um, I have some over here. It's okay to be happy. You know, you are worthy. You are deserving. And that's the way that I move through reminding myself that I am deserving, reminding myself that, you know, this is the space that I am meant to be. in. I was called into this work and that's how I navigate it and, th- and deal with it. And also by not pushing down my feelings, you know, I feel like sometimes you have that moment where you're trying to like run away from your feelings because you feel like you shouldn't be feeling like that. So I let my myself feel my feels and I, I I analyze them like why am I feeling like this find the root cause of it and then I affirm myself through it yeah I think for me um a lot of that like imposter syndrome really came from like other black women in the workforce mm-hmm. and and I think that's something that really like is underspoken about like we don't really you know we go into a place and it's just like you know all skin folk ain't your kin folk right so and, and sometimes it, you learn that in those hard those harder lessons and i think for me you know i came from an hbcu where we just literally loved on each other and was celebrated for whatever we did and then going into you know the federal government and then having you know a black woman supervisor that looks like me and i'm just like oh my gosh she's gonna take me underneath her wing she's gonna mentor me and then it was just completely hard horrible, you know, and just learning lessons like that. So it makes me, you know, it really made me look at, you know, do I deserve to be where I'm at? Or I have to work 10 times harder now because I'm a black woman, because I'm a younger black woman, where the age gap is about 30 years Mm -hmm. in the office. So just feeling like, okay, I know I deserve to be here, but when other people make you feel like, okay, well, you know, you're young, you don't know anything, you kind of start to internalize those things, right? You feel like you have to overcompensate in a way that you have to prove your worth. And I feel like, you know, along the way, I really learned that, no, it's, you mm-hmm. don't have to do that, you know? I feel like we, we're going to be oppressed so much in the workforce regardless, right? By other people, by by white people, by white men, by white women, whatever the case may be. But I think it's important to just know that, you know, when you are feeling this way to just definitely, you know, lean on your tribe for sure and let them pour into you. And I know sometimes we just like, we're very modest, we're humble, like, oh, okay, yeah, that's me, thank you. But let people celebrate you and let them lift you up and remind you. Like I literally sat here and listened to my bio being read and I'm like, Oh my gosh, it's like hefty. it's hefty. It's a hefty bio. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it's just sometimes you need that reminder. So don't be afraid, you know, to, to to pop your talk and really just brag about yourself. And people who love you will brag on you as well. And don't ever ever be ashamed about that either. Yes. Yeah, I agree with everything these ladies have said. Um, even to this day, you know, I struggle with imposter syndrome, but it's a, you know, for me, a matter of remembering that, you know, I didn't go through all the, everything that I went through um, without a purpose and every, I didn't arrive here by chance. You know, there's so many tests and so many interviews mm-hmm. and things that you have to go through to be a medical doctor. And I'm a woman of faith. And, you know, I know that, you know, God didn't allow me to, you know, get to this place by chance. And, you know, I'm equipped with the things that I need in order to be successful in this role and whatever, you know, that I need to be added to for me to succeed, he will provide. Yes. So Amen. what I'm hearing is all you have, all you need is the tools to battle it, but it's a constant struggle with each stage. So that's something to really keep in mind as someone who's still in the beginning stages as well. So with all the amazing work that you do and all the work, you know, that you do, I can imagine it gets heavy, especially with the populations that you serve, with the type of work that you do. So what are some things that you do to help keep your spirits up? I know you mentioned traveling, you've mentioned, you know, your spirit work. How, what are other things that you do to make sure that you're not being consumed by some of the negativity that you face in your respective fields? For me, I think it's a matter of, you know, being intentional about carving out time for yourself. You know, the same way that We've all taken time to be like, I have to study and do X, Y, Z questions. Like, even though it may not be, you know, the hours and hours that I truly desire, even if I need to take 30 minutes to do, you know, something I enjoy, it might just be watching a TV show or catching up with one of my friends, you know, trying to, you know, take your mind off of those things that are burdening you at the moment. Exercise. Exercise. 
Yes. I mean, fitting it into your day, I, I, I literally like crawl to the gym like mm -hmm. after my work day, but I feel so much better once I get there and I accomplish it because I know I don't want to do it, but mm -hmm. allow to see how your body transforms when you pour into yourself and you allow yourself to do that. I think that is one of the best forms of self-care um, that, that's out there completely because not only are you physically taking care of yourself, you're allowing your mind to focus. You're you're shutting out the distractions. So you got your mind, got your body, got your soul all just working together at once. So I think it's it's great to be able to do something physical, whether it's in the gym or taking a walk outside or swimming or just something active to release those endorphins and really make you feel better. I love that. Um, for me, I love to laugh, if y'all haven't noticed. So <laughs> I love a good comedy movie or even memes. Memes make my world go round, quite mm. honestly. So that just laughter is so healing for the soul. Um, and I also love taking a good walk like in nature. I'm a SoCal girl through and through, even though I live in the Bay Area right now. That's a whole different story. But I'm a SoCal girl through and through. So I'm used to the sunshine. I'm also a summer baby. So I love being outside, just letting the wind hit my face, letting the sun just come and just interface with my melanin. It's just the most amazing thing ever. So especially after I've had a hard day, like back-to-back -back meetings where I haven't had like any reprieve and I just now had breakfast at three o'clock, like that type of day, I need to go outside. I need some sunshine. I need to walk and just some fresh air. So have you always been like that where you're like, you know, I need to do something for me? Because I know when you first started out. Yeah. So how did you get to that point? Because <laughs> right now I'm like, oh, that sounds great. <laughs> Watching the stuff <laughs> like, that I want to do, walking, <laughs> exercise. I'm like, how did you get there? How did you get to the point where you're like, you know what? This is a priority. I am a priority. I'm helping people, but I have to prioritize myself too. It took burnout. It mm -hmm. took literally becoming sick, like to the point that I'm I'm in the bed and cannot get out of the bed, like sick, like having to call out of work, having to cancel clients to really say, you know what, this is God's way of showing me I need to slow down because I'm not going to do it on my own. You know, I feel like when you're a giver, when you're a community servant, it's very hard for you to detach from that. You know, you're bringing your stuff home. You're having weaker boundaries because you just spending so much time and pouring in because it's your passion, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just a job. It's your passion. It's your calling. It's your purpose and what you're supposed to do. But I had to really just pull back when I'm just like, you know what? I'm at the state of exhaustion where I'm nauseous, where I'm tired. My body is aching. And I'm like, you know, I can't reach that point anymore because if I don't pour into myself, I can't pour into others. Right. So having that aha moment, you know, I'm, I'm literally I'm having an epiphany that I need to slow down. So allow myself to really take those breaks, you know, really setting firm boundaries of myself. You know, at five o'clock, I'm not replying to emails. You know, four o'clock on Fridays, my phone is off until it's time to work on Monday. But being strict with myself and, and being firm with myself has really helped me to say, OK, I got to get better, because if I if I'm not good, then I can't be good for anybody else. Mm -hmm. Preach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I have to agree, you know, reaching a place of burnout. That's not a place that you want to be. But, you know, there was a point where, you know, I felt like I was working myself to the bone and, you know, not getting the results that I desired, like as far as, you know, testing and my performance in school, I'm like, hey, something is not right here. Right. Let's take a step back and try, you know, try something else. And lo and behold, you know, once I started prioritizing myself and my self-care, I started, you know, performing better. I was able to show up and, you know, be a more active participant in the care team. Um, I would say so showing up in my full humanity, I am still working through it. And I, you know what I mean, working through how to prioritize, you know, those self care walks and how to prioritize my own self care. It's an ongoing like it's an ongoing thing. Like one week, I may like just kill it like mm -hmm. oh, fuck every day I did it. Ooh, ooh, right. Then the next week, it's like, Oh, I forgot to even watch something funny or you know what I mean. So every week, it's just like, it's a constant thing for me. I haven't arrived at a space where it's like, constant if that makes sense so for me it's ongoing and i'm still trying to navigate it and learn my way through it and just being like speaking from my own truth no that's real i just it's just interesting that it takes us having to basically be forced to stop before things happen because i know for me my force quit was covid because it's mm -hmm. like you know you're doing the hustle bustle on campus and all of a sudden now you're back at home you're just like whoa what is life <laughs> 
<laughs> so it was just like having to like really recalibrate myself and really be more intentional about my time, be more intentional with myself, I think has helped me as well. So it's just it's just interesting how that's like a common thread amongst all of us where it's like we had to be forced to stop rather than us being healthily stopped, you know? So it's pretty interesting to me. So we are at 655, you know, we have five minutes left. I wanted to know if you guys had any like one liner takeaways for our um, audience here, something that they can take away with them if they haven't learned anything else from the panel. I know they've learned something because you guys were very fruitful, but what is something that you want our audience to take away from your journey, from your experiences, from your life? Um, I have to say, I don't know if it's just like one line or one word. Oh, no, you can do it. any you know, line. Everyone yeah, be um, mindful that, you know, everyone has their own journey. If there, you know, is a dream that you're trying to achieve, you know, keep going. You'll eventually get there. Um, you know, we've all had our own struggles and you are not alone. Um, you know, there's somebody out there that's struggling just like you or who knows how to overcome those struggles. So make sure to reach out to people and just, you know, stay in community along the journey, whatever journey it is that you're on. Mm -hmm. I like that one. Yeah, and I think. Yeah, I think for me, um, my biggest thing is time is a social construct. Don't let time really, um, you know, just prohibit you from doing what you want to do. Right? Don't say, "Oh, I'm too old to do this," or "I waited too long." Right? You could either be 45 with a doctoral degree, right, or 45 without one. Right? You know, God willing, you make it there. But it's just like. Time is nothing. Don't let that distract you from, you know, reaching your fullest potential, from being your authentic self. There's no such thing as being too old. Don't let that, you know, don't let people get in your head with that, but just really utilize your time and do what it is that you want, because at the end of the day, you don't get it back. So spend your time doing what you want to do and what makes you happy. I love everything um, that both of you have said. I think for me, the biggest thing is what is your passion? Like, I think um, the common, another common theme that we can see here is that we're all really passionate about what we do and where we're going and who we serve. And I think it's that thing. It's like, what's that thing that riles you up? Like, what's that thing that just makes you, that calls you to your work? You know what I mean? That calls you to a specific sector or a specific people. You know, whenever I have a chance to mentor folks or speak about my journey, I ask them that question. Like, why are you passionate about this? Because you will get burnt out and you will not want to do it anymore, especially if you're you're working in a in the role of a servant, working with community, working within like mental health, whether it be you know a medical profession, whether it be you know hands off, or whether it be like within the role of birth work, you're gonna get tired of it. You have to be passionate about it. You know what I mean? Like what is calling you here? And when you figure out what it is, and when you figure out your why, like hold on to that because you're gonna need it for those moments. You're gonna need it for those moments where you have back to back meetings. <laughs> you're gonna need it for those moments, right? Where those you know the the higher ups are are not agreeing with the program that you're trying to implement, right? You're going to need it when you're constantly coming up against white supremacy because it's everywhere. You're going to need it when you enter the workforce. You're going to need it when you're interfacing with the community because community can smell when you don't really care, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? They can literally smell it a mile away. So what's your why? Find out and stick to it. Write it down if you have to, but just figure out what it is. Man, just beautifully said. I'm just so blessed to have been in community with you all today. And thank you so much for being here, for sharing the space with me. And I'm sure our audience gained a lot of gems from you all. Um, so thank you again for tuning in to the panel discussion of Black women in the workforce, early career professionals. And I hope you enjoy the discussion today and that you tune in tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern time for a virtual yoga session with Kiana Mia, who is a co-founder of Black Yogis of South Florida, and then later tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. Eastern time for our Grab Your Girls and Go panel discussion, exploring the realities of navigating the healthcare system as Black women and the importance of community care. RSVP with the link below to receive an MSK self-care box while supplies last. Thank you so much.